This is Musings of the Shy podcast. I'm your host, Rosia Shy. Hello, Rosia Shy here, <clears throat> and I'm here to discuss uh, the last of the mining episodes that is part of the uh, series of episodes that we're talking to build up to discuss um, the block size debate in which we're just kind of breaking down the various components from the philosophy that brought people into Bitcoin, um, the people, the contributors to help um, build the code, the businesses that are involved, um, what a mining pool is, the purpose of mining, um, what else do we discuss? Uh, We kind of hinted at some of the type of solutions that are being proposed. Uh, but we haven't really um, gotten into the nitty-gritty technical aspects of that. Uh, we, t- we discussed what a BIP is, which is part of the uh, building blocks of building up the uh, Bitcoin protocol, which is um, called Bitcoin Core. So this is the last of the mining episodes, and this is about the Hong Kong Agreement. It's an agreement that was made about two years ago, which a lot of people within the community decried because it was pretty much one of the series of a few of these kind of closed door meetings. And I guess we'll discuss that some other time um, on the show. We discuss about closed door meetings and how it really didn't have much of the community input, but it was basically the miners, um, the core developers, or I should say members of the block strip and a few other companies came to an understanding agreement that there was going to be a raise of the block size, there was a, it was going to be a roadmap, and that a designated date this was going to happen. And of course, that didn't happen. And we'll discuss that when we talk about the agreement. Um, I did state earlier in the previous mining episode that I was going to talk about the recent agreement that came out of the consensus um, conference that occurred in, I believe it was in New York? Yeah, I think it was in New York. I'm not positive where the consensus uh, took place, uh, but that agreement was some another agreement where there's going to be a user-activated soft fork, a SegWit soft fork that was supposed to activate October, not October, August 1st of this year. That's what the agreement. It was a very uh, a lot of series of businesses uh, within the block uh, Bitcoin community space, and as well as within the block debate, these different companies have made their positions known one way or the other, or have stated they had were non-committal and go with what the network says, and now have taken a position. Uh, we'll talk about that kind of after the technical aspects of the discussion of the block size debate, because you have to understand what SegWit is and what um, Bitcoin Unlimited, block extensions, what all these different components are. But before we get into this Hong Kong agreement, let's discuss the news. So what we have in the news is very interesting. We have an update and then a little bit of an update as well about a uh, prize game that I've been following in the cryptocurrency space. So let's get into the, this update, which is from The Wire, and it's by our, one of our favorite Wired authors, Andy Greenberg. And it's about the Silk Road case. Or I should should say more about the Silk Road marketplace in the aftermath, if you will. So the Silk Road creator's life sentence actually boosted dark web drug sales. Uh, This was actually published uh, last week. Uh, Two years ago this week, Ross Ulbricht was sentenced to life in prison without parole for running the Silk Road. An unprecedented drug dark web bazaar for drugs and other contraband. I should say within either by this month or sometime... Well, actually, this month is over, almost over. I wish to say sometime by mid-June, definitely before July, we should hear some kind of update as far as the appeal process for the um, Olbridge case. Um, as of right now, there hasn't been, or at least I haven't seen any news about any decision as of yet. The judge intended the sentence to serve as a warning to other would-be internet uh, narco-traffickers, but new research suggests more clearly than ever before that the strategy of making an example of Ulbricht didn't deter Silk Road users. In fact, it may have the opposite effect. In a study published in the forthcoming issue of the British Journal of Criminology, Boston College sociologist Isaac uh, Lager provides some of the strongest quantitative evidence yet that the dark web drug trade actually received a sales bump following the news of Ulbricht's surprisingly harsh sentence. Starting in late 2014, uh, Laggard used a software tool he built to troll what to trawl what was then the largest Silk Road-style dark web markets daily for sales data. He focused on a 10-month ten ten <clears throat> he focused on a 10-month window that included the time directly before and after Albert's sentencing, and he found that the following Albert sentence 
sentencing, the site experienced a significant increase in revenue. The timing suggests that people weren't discouraged from buying and selling drugs this longer. The data suggests that the trade increased. And one likely explanation is that all the media coverage only made people more aware of the existence of the Silk Road and similar markets. I find that very fascinating. And I think while this was very significant, the whole trawling in, uh, of the um, dark web, if you will, and this is not the only study, but I guess this is a more, like I stated in the article, quantitative. But it would be interesting to see if the server that was used in the the case, the Silk Road server, if that's ever that data is ever released to the public because that data will have, it has all the information, has all the public addresses, uh, the physical addresses for a lot of these different um, dr uh, drug users as well as drug vendors. And it would be interesting to see the data point spread of, you know, where the users were, where the vendors were, uh, well, you know, country of origin and things of that nature. And then just see, like, for example, Berlin and see what, you know, when people started selling, when people started using, um, the spread out, if you will, of, you know, the increase of usage, um, did it occur because one particular vendor came on? What was the significant attribute that caused the expansion? Or was it pretty much the same as other places where it just kind of slowly rose? But the reason why I say, like, if, for example, of Berlin, is what it did in general for the drug marketplace was there an actual de decrease in crime where as more users and more vendors came on silk road is, was there any kind of correlation where there was a drop or was there no significant change it would be interesting to see what, if we can get those kind of data points and just kind of look and i gra granted i'm kind of given a bias uh, premise here where i'm kind of looking for an answer but It'd be interesting to see where the data points are and what they what the information leads us to. But going on here, the finding could draw, could draw scrutiny to the deterrent fact value of harsh sentences and little understood computer crimes, particularly those where the risk of getting caught remains uncertain and where publicity can inspire copycat criminals. Boom times. So the dark web has only grown in the years since the FBI seized the Silk Road servers and arrested its creator in late 2013. At the time, the site had roughly 12,000 listings for items ranging from marijuana and ecstasy to heroin to counterfeit documents. The largest dark web market today, Alpha Bay, has well over 300,000 listings, including more than 240,000 for drug alone. It also offers other wares like weapons and stolen data that the Silk Road didn't. That's a key thing. Everyone thinks that you could get assassins and um, guns and the, those type of things, and um, they were very good about keeping that stuff off the site. That was not something they were for. Uh, but Nygaard's study shows that more granular evidence is that the dark web experienced a boost in sales in the immediate wake of Ulbricht's punishment. Starting in November of 2014, Lagard used a, f a Python script to pull sale listings and customer feedback information for Argo, then the largest drug web market. And since Argo transactions require user feedback, Lagard could combine public feedback on any given item with the item's listings and the price to gauge total sales on the site over time. The resulting data showed that Argo's illicit business didn't just weather Albert's life sentence. For vendors shipping the products from the U.S., sales more than doubled in the following days, skyrocketing from less than 40000 a day to more than $100,000 daily in just two weeks. International sales increased even more dramatically from 100000 to 250000 daily. That's a direct contra contradiction to the deterrence value that the judge in the Albert's case used to justify, justify his sentence. For those considering stepping into your shoes carrying some misguided flag, they need to understand very clearly and without equivocation that if you break the law this is the way there will be very very severe consequences judge Catherine foster said in her courtroom sentence statement subject to risk uh ladgar can see that he can't definitely explain those results but he raised the sales bumps more generally followed media coverage of the dark web and albert's life sentence with major news wire's story on the sentence in loan was read more than a half a million times over his 10 months of data ladgar also collected 310 articles about the silk road and dark web drug sites that found that weeks with more than news even about law enforcement actions against the sites correlated with more sales. The study is careful to note, however, that the severity of Albert's life sentence may have prevented an even bigger bump. It is possible that the media coverage of the trial attracted new customers and vendors who otherwise would not have known that the crypto market existed, Lagarde writes, but the number of new registrants would have been much larger if Silk Road's founder had been acquitted. Lagarde went further in his analysis of the dark web user's mindset, though. He collected sentiments from the user's forums of Argo and separate sites known as the Hub, designed to serve as community folk forum access dark web markets. The conversation he observed in the wake of the Albert sentencing suggests that buyers and sellers blame Albert himself for his rest. 
not the power of law enforcement investigation techniques. Rather than see Ulrich's downfall as inevitable, inve- in- <clears throat> inevitable, the anonymous commentators to try to assist themselves call him a scared, shitless kid who was way out of his depth, careless and over his head and arrogant. In other words, Langard argues the deterrent- deterrence value of harsh sentences from com- computer crimes like s- selling dark web drugs may differ from other crimes, given that criminals have widely varying notions of the risk involved. The objective risk of getting caught isn't so important as the subject, subjective perception of the risk. You might feel safe because you're doing stuff on your computer in the comfort of your living room, or you could be more paranoid because you don't know what law enforcement is doing to track you down. In the case of the Ulbricht sentencing, at least the more common reactions appear to be curiosity and the sense of impunity undiminished by Ulbricht's state. The Silk Road's founder made language in a New York prison, but his business model continues to thrive. I would say that, yes, the business model of the dark web marketplace is out there and it is mm, kind of thriving i mean it's not quite what it was i would say even as a two years ago when ross Oberch was being sentenced even a year ago um there's been a lot we talked about it about a lot of the exit scams that have happened i think the very we've talked discussed the very nature of the ones that are out there and, and what ross Oberch are doing are completely different marketplaces if you will or ways to conduct business. And that's the end of that news. And this is a tweet from Charlie Lee. It came out, uh, what was the date? May 24th. So congratulations to at uh, uh, CY Borges for solving the puzzle and getting 230 um, LTC solutions based on the 16 by 16 bitmap. Uh, so there was a puzzle that went out, uh, which was a in the shape of the Litecoin um, crypto symbol for Litecoin, and it was solved. I have a link in the show notes to the YouTube page that shows the, the solution, as well as the GitHub. But um, yeah, it took two weeks. I thought it was only up for a week, but it was two weeks for it to be solved, uh, which I think is one of the longest. I think there was a Bitcoin, one of the Bitcoin paintings that's been out there. It was like a month or maybe two months before it was solved. But this is one of the... the um, at least the ones I've seen that have been put up on Twitter or any Reddit posts that have been um, taking this long to solve. Most of those typically take a day to even two days, but this took two weeks. So kudos to Charlie Lee for coming up with a crypto puzzle that took this long for the community to come up with a solution. And congratulations to um, CY Borges for him and his team. I, there was a group of them that did this uh, for coming up with a solution. And that is it for the news. On to the Hong Kong agreement. So this comes from the actual Bitcoin Bitcoin roundtable. Um, the businesses, exchanges, wallets, miners, and mining pools that made this agreement. I thought this agreement was actually a bit older. I thought this came out in December of 2015, but this came out February of uh, 2016. So it's more than a year old. And it goes like this. On February 21st, 2016, in Hong Kong's cyber port, representatives from the Bitcoin industry and members of the development community have agreed on the following points. We understand that SegWit continues to be developed actively against a soft fork and is likely to produce pr- to proceed towards release over the next two months as originally scheduled. We will continue to work with the entire Bitcoin protocol development community to develop in public a safe hard fork based on the improvements in SegWit. The Bitcoin, the Bitcoin core contributors present, present at the Bitcoin Roundtable will have the implementation of such a hard fork available at the recommendation to Bitcoin Core within three months after the release of SegWit. This hard fork is expected to include features which are currently being discussed within the technical co- communities, including an increase in the non-witness data to be around 2 megabytes with a total size no more than 4 megabytes and will only be adopted with a broad support across the entire Bitcoin community. We will run a SegWit release in the production by the time such a hard fork was released in the, in the version of Bitcoin Core. We will only run Bitcoin Core compatible consensus systems, eventually containing both SegWit and the hard fork in the production for the foreseeable future. We are committed to the scaling technologies which will use block space more efficiently, such as a Sh- uh, Schnorner multisig. Based on the above points, the timeline will likely follow the below dates. SegWit is expected to be released in April 2016. The code for the hard fork will therefore be available by July 2016. If there is a strong community support, the hard fork activation will likely happen around July 2017. 
The undersigned supports this roadmap. Together we are Kevin Pan, manager of Ampool, Antonio uh, Leg Legamov, CEO of AXPT, Larry uh, Sauber, a Bitcoin Association in Hong Kong, and Lena Wies, Bitcoin Association in Hong Kong, Corey Fields, Bitcoin Core contributor, Jason Lau, Bitcoin Core contributor, Luke Jash Jr., Bitcoin Core contributor, Matt Correll, a Bitcoin Core contributor, Peter Todd, Bitcoin Core contributor, Zan Z, Bitcoin Roundtable, Phil Potter, Chief Strategist Officer of Bitfinex, uh, Valerie uh, Valvola, CEO of Bitfury, Alex Padrovo, CIO of Bitfury, uh, Jean Wu, C uh, CEO, CEO, or co CEO of Bitmain, uh, Marseille Song, co CEO of Bitmain, James Hilder, Paul slash farm um, admin of Bitmain Warranty, Yoshi Guto, CEO of Bitmain Warranty, Alex Sho, CEO of BTX Exchange, Han Solo, C. <laughs> that's an awesome name. Uh, CEO of Block uh, Cloud, Adam Beck, President of Blockstream, Bobby Lee, CEO of BTCC, Samson Mo, CCO of BTCC, uh, Robin Yao, CTO of BW, Obi uh, Naswa, Managing Director of Coin4, Mark Lam, Founder of Coin4, Wang Chung, <laughs> Admin of uh, FT Pool, Mark String, CEO of Genesis Mining, Mark Cronin, CFO of Genesis Mining, Alexa Dam, Lutus CEO of Geohash and CXIO, Wu Gang, CEO of Haybo uh, BTC, Leon Lee, a CEO of Hebu, uh, Zanjun, Vice President of Hebu, Eric uh, Larjaviku, CEO of Ledger, Jack Lau, CEO of Lightning, ASIC, and Big Exchange, Star Exu, CEO of OKGO, OK Jack Wu, Head of International OKGO, OK uh, Guy Kr Chroman, CEO of Spundles Tech, uh, Nipidar Wong, sponsor. So that happened, and of course, within a week, they just came crashing down. A lot of it had to do with the feedback by the community. He did not agree that all these individuals gathered together to not only make this statement, but actually put out a roadmap and make a decision that Many people are not exactly for not everyone's for Segwit. Um, there are individuals that are not agreeing about the whole um, raising the block size. There is also a, a kind of a mindset to where miners should be able to do what they feel is necessary, and whoever has the longest um, blockchain is the winner, if you will. The consensus is by individual decision, and then and no one should have an overall say of the network, if you can think of it that way. And so there was a significant virtual over this, in particular the fact that even though the, the round table, there was like a convention or a meeting, and a lot of the participants, um, there was a little bit of video, little articles coming out from that space, but no one themselves, this wasn't like broadcast really. Um, it was hinted at, but no one believed that this was actually coming. Kind of was sprung onto the community, if you will. And again, this is kind of the mindset where this uh, roadmap and financial planning, if you will, is something from the old system where you get from the banks or from government and doesn't really fit completely in with the Bitcoin community. And I think there wasn't a sufficient feedback or dialogue or input where members of the community could contribute to this dialogue before any type of agreement could occur and not everyone that's in this space um, made or participated within with this type of agreement so of course it fell apart and, and look at the dates you had July 20, 2017 is when the hard fork supposed to happen and then you have SegWit that was supposed to have activated last year mind you all these discussions have been going on Pretty much since I would say 2013, really consistently, consistently since 2014, and here we are at 2017 with a lot of different proposals. Many of them are not coming from the the Bitcoin Core devs themselves, and there is another agreement where there's supposed to be a user software activated fork. They're supposed to activate August 1st of 2017, so a month after what was supposed to be was supposed to be the hard fork. So let's talk about the problems, if you will. 
of this uh, roundtable. This comes from Bitcoin Magazine. It's by Aaron Van Weirden. It was published November 22nd of 2016. The status of the Hong Kong hard fork in an update. So last February, in the midst of the Bitcoin's long-lasting block size dispute, a group of Bitcoin developers, Bitcoin miners, and representatives from the Bitcoin industry met in Hong Kong, sealing the position with a signed letter the attendees agreed to run only Bitcoin core compatible consensus software for the foreseeable future. This avoided a potential hard fork as proposed by you know, Bitcoin Classic or Bitcoin Unlimited, at least temporarily. On their own behalf, the Bitcoin developers presented the meeting, Corey Fields, Jason Liu, Luke Dash Jr., uh, Matt Correll, and Peter Todd. Um, I believe everyone here is part of Blockstream. Let me double check that. Okay, so I think it's just Luke Dash is um, part of Blockstream. And everyone else is just a Bitcoin dev with uh, different places, if you will. Yeah. Oh. So they agreed to propose a block size hard fork with a deadline set three months after the release of segregated witness. If accepted by other Bitcoin core developers and the broader Bitcoin community, the proposal would, could pave the way to the block size limit increase. After months of testing and some delay, Bitcoin Core 0.13.1 became available to the public in the last week of October. With that, segregated witness was officially released. Per the original agreement from February, this leaves the signatories to the agreement of who we call the, Hong, the uh, Hong Kong developers with about 10 more weeks to propose a hard fork. Soft fork. A typical hard fork essentially creates a new protocol and a network to which all users must migrate, bending the old protocol in the process. Unfortunately, this presents an inherent risk that not all users switch. The original protocol can live on, essentially creating two distinctive networks and currencies, a coin split. That's exactly what happened on Ethereum blockchain as a result of the contentious hard fork last summer splitting into Ethereum and Ethereum Classic. So no one wants to have that experience. There was some double spending. There was a lot of shenanigans that happened with that. Eventually, both sides were able to separate themselves. But there was, I think that took some weeks for that to happen and really more like a couple months for that to really occur. The Hong Kong, Hong Kong, <clears throat> the Hong Kong developers therefore prefer a soft hard fork, also known as a forced soft fork or a firm fork, and sometimes referred to as an evil soft fork. Like typical hard forks, a soft hard fork can, can change any protocol rule, including the block size limit. As Peter Todd told Bitcoin Magazine, many prefer a soft hard fork for the perceived reduction in the chance that the currency will split. Specifically, miners apply a soft hard fork through hash power majority by only mining empty blocks on the original protocol blocks that contain no transactions. Users that stay behind on this old chain therefore can neither accept nor send any payments. In other words, they run no risk of being defrauded on an otherwise abandoned network. Meanwhile, all new transactions are moved to a sort of an add-on blockchain that only knows that have upgraded for the soft hard fork can see. While the original blockchain is still used for proof of work security, the new protocol exists in parallel. Coin voiding. The main drawback of a soft hard fork is that it can be applied against the wish of the users in the sense that it's somewhat corrosive. Unless they want to await a possible return of miners to the original protocol, users have no choice but to upgrade to the new rules or to hard fork to an entirely new protocol themselves, in effect creating a new network and currency after all. To avoid both a corrosive situation and a coin split, the Hong Kong developers wanted a solid indication that a soft hard fork has, has consist, uh, consent from the Bitcoin community. They have therefore been considered two types of solutions to measure consenting. Consent, both of them based on coins controlled by users, known as coin signaling. This solution will allow for a much safer hard fork, but showing that the Bitcoin holders and users actually approve of the fork, Todd said. One of these methods inspired by the hard fork opt-out bits lets users include extra data in all transactions they make, therefore signaling support for a potential fork. If all transactions over a certain time period include this data, they serve as an indication the users are ready to fork. Todd has also been developing a solution to let users vote when the coins they hold, even if they do not transact. On his blog, uh, Todd explained in August. I've been working on coming up with a more concrete mechanism based on signal voting, voting propositional to coins held in particular, out of band mechanics based on a signed message and probably probabilistic sampling that could potentially offer better privacy and censorship resistance and give holders who aren't necessarily doing frequent transactions a voice as well. The proposal. Yet, when it comes to a concrete proposal, some uncertainty remains. 
Luke Dash, who is in addition to the Bitcoin Core, also maintains a Bitcoin Knots presented an in intention soft fork proposal and preliminary code back in February, two weeks before the group met in Hong Kong. He kept improving it in months that followed, and it's a proposal that forms the more the most concrete basis of the proposed Hong Kong hard fork. This proposal would increase the block size limit through the exact size of the increases yet to be specified, and according to the Hong Kong Roundtable consensus, the increase should be around 2 megabytes, but also include a recent discount on witness data to ensure that adversarial conditions don't allow blocks bigger than 4 megabytes. The proposal also includes further rather uncontroversial optimization. Progress on development, though, has slowed down over the last months. This is in part because the Bitcoin miners don't, do not seem very interested in the proposal, Todd said. Perhaps more importantly, several developers, both those in the Hong Kong and others, consider the agreement to have been broken by at least one counterparty in the deal, the Chinese, mi Chinese mining F2 pool. The whole point of putting run Bitcoin core compatible clients in the agreement was for miners to stop playing political games for a few months, Todd explained, and to give developers a reason to work with them. But not doing that, we have been totally unable to get any developers to consider joining the effort, and if anything, the experience soured them on the very idea. Deal. Additionally, most of the Hong Kong developers have seemingly come to believe that the short-term community consensus on block size limit hard fork is virtually impossible in the current climate. The community clearly doesn't want a hard fork, and the Ethereum fiasco just sealed that, Lee Dash Jr. told Bitcoin Magazine. Moving forward, that said, the Hong Kong developers will continue to work on the proposals, something Todd noted that they were planning to do either way, whether it would be finished within a lot of three months after the segregated witness release uncertain. Nothing in the agreement on the developer side was stuff we weren't interested in doing anyways, Todd said. The whole point was to find some common ground that people didn't previously know they had. So I'm still working on my part, which is design and implement better approval mechanisms that don't rely on miners to approve forks, but soft and hard. Uh, Dash Jr. also said he would continue to work on proposals. While he is no longer strongly committed to presenting fully finalized hard fork code within the original three-month deadline, he might, and he remains hopeful, that the solution will eventually be adopted. Maybe in a few years things will change, Dash Jr. said, and after the hard fork, all corners can go away. Yeah, we'll we'll talk about that mindset, if you will. So problems abound, and here um, it's like a, a little insert from BitcoinStackExchange.com, where a question was proposed, like, what is the status of the Hong Kong agreement? This was made like 11 months ago, if you will. So uh, June 7th of 16th. Um, the question was, what is the status of the Hong Kong agreement? Um, are the bullet points below still valid? We understand that SegWit continues to be developed actively as a soft work and is likely to proceed towards release over the next two months as originally scheduled. We continue to work with the big, okay, so it goes over the kind of the propul um, proposals. Uh, we continue to work with the entire Bitcoin protocol community development and public and safe hard fork based on the improvements in SegWit. So that's the second point. The hard fork is expected to increase Features which are currently being discussed with the technical communities. We will run SegWit release in production by the time such a hard fork is released in the version of Bitcoin Core. We will only run Bitcoin Core compatible consistent systems and we are committed to scaling technologies with, which use block space more effectively such as uh, Shonen um, Multisigs. And so someone answered. Um, the full code of the SegWit witness was released on April 19th which is to the letter fulfills the requirement. However, apparently some people had understood the first point to me that it would be in production in April, which was not the case. So there's some contention with that. Following the bub, implementation of the hard fork was expected to be delivered by 19th of July. And RIC Bitman's uh, John Wu has recently stated that point four is to be interpreted as them requiring the code for block size increase hard fork to have been merged into the Bitcoin core before they run segregated witness in production. This is, of course, a much stronger requirement than point two and point four, which could be read as stated to use SegWit, Seg, SegWit as the latest when code for a hard fork is released. This argument has been made by the following voting for Classic, the Bitcoin Classic, which is a proposal. Some polls have breached point 0.5. Their disagreement here is chiefly about whether Classic and constitutes an incompatible version. Until a Classic node activates, it follows the same rules, so proponents argue it's compatible. Yet since Classic breaks with the current rules as soon as it activates, others declare it to to be not Bitcoin Core compatible. Although it seems that there are still a lot of misunderstandings and conflicts of interest to be ironed out, vastly diverging priorities and language barriers added to the difficulties, there also seems to be a very different assumption 
about where the community support lies and how the power dynamics in Bitcoin will work out. As far as I can tell, we can only wait and see how the situation develops. The next step appears to be the intimate inclusion of segregated witnesses with the next Bitcoin Core release candidate, which has happened. And when some miners start signaling readiness for segregated witness, the situation will probably evolve it quickly. There is there is the kind of the, the issues, if you will. So let's talk more about these type of problems, if you will. So here's an article um, off a of medium by Zhang Sang that came out in April. If Bitmain imposes SegWit because of ASIC boost, why did they agree to the Hong Kong Roundtable? Activating SegWit before a block size increase. Uh, this is translated from the original essay by Jean uh, Zoyer. One, the source of the chat log. Oh, okay, first, hold on. I'd like to address the article on Associated Chat, chat Transcripts published yesterday by Whale Panda. While Yang Yi and Yang want to block SegWit at all. So these guys are part of Bitmain. See, so Yang Yang is Antpool plus Bitmain, and Jun Yi is LTC and BTC mining pool. So these guys are, are kind of big players in the space. The source of the chat log. The chat transcripts included in the Whale Pandas article came from a WeChat group that is used by Chinese Litecoin pools and Litecoin developers to communicate with one another. There are 15 people in the group and Whale Pandas selectively chose a screenshot to create the appearance that this is kind of a secret society. So let's talk about the article itself. Uh, so it's very short basically. It's, um, it's by Whale Panda. Timestamp chat logs why Zhang Ying and Zhang want to block SegWit at all costs. I won't write a full article, we'll just let the chat log speak for itself. The following Bitcoin blockchain timestamp chat log is between Chinese miners and Litecoin developers discussing activating SegWit on Litecoin. Their chat log is from November slash December 2016. We now know that they are signaling SegWit on Litecoin, but for some reason still oppose it on Bitcoin. And the participants are the ones I just read. So here's the interesting thought talk about the cost of SegWit software, which we now know is about ASIC boots. On the issue of SegWit software, we will pay a far greater cost than you can imagine. Uh, we are in this together, so you developers will feel how great great it is eventually. Um, that is a statement from Zhang Yi Sun. And then Zhang Yi Sun continues, I suggest we abandon the road of no return, that is, this soft fork, uh, SegWit soft fork, and try to seek the direction which minimizes both of our costs. Zhang Wang responds to his post, I still don't understand why SegWit must be activated with a hard fork. Soft forks can accomplish the same under much smaller risk. Uh, Zhao responded back to Wang. On the issue of the SW soft fork, we will pay a far greater cost than you can imagine. The cost is not up to you or me to decide. Wang says, please be specific. Zhao, there's going to be a direct impact on Bitcoin's adoption of SegWit soft fork. Very clear uh, precedence we cannot explain to the community we do oppose a SegWit soft fork on BPC, but support a SegWit soft fork on LTC and our world would be without a just cause. Whoops, this is an editorial of the uh, Wanda Pair. We are only blocking SegWit at Long King because otherwise we couldn't justify it for Bitcoin too. What if there are multiple chains after a hard fork is what Jing Ying Wu, or no, that's an editorial. So Jing Ying Wu jumps in and says the pools will ignite and kill it. Uh, lots of accusations in this part of the log still talking about chain split. So that he kind of edits and jumps around. This is like a little bit of a red in here in the article. So Jenny Wu comes in and he goes, the only people who are going to create trouble for the whole upgrading process are those from Blockstream. So we need to take caution, cautions against them. Zhang Wu says they may like, like they do, did with ETC interfere with the affairs of the LTC. Jenny Wu continues, they will help the minor chain coin to be tradable at the exchange. And then in red, the system will collapse if we allow upgrades through soft forks. Johnny Zhu hard forking will be able to deliver a technical upgrade in a cleaner and stable manner. Without the technical debts, we can hard fork to SW and we don't need to consider a soft fork. Um, he continues, the more technical features are acquired with soft forks, the dirtier the system's architect will become. And he continues, in long term, it's going to collapse. And in red here, SegWit is still good, though, according to Zhang Ying. Uh, Zhang Ying, in some sense, SW is a result of technical people's obsession with cleanliness. It's indeed good, but it's not something that cannot be done without. Um, and then red here, is, this is not about soft fork or hard fork. 
Zara. If an SW soft fork is activated, it means that the romance of the core's eventual victory and the complete defeat of the big block camp. This is not about SFW so uh, soft fork segwit or hard fork segwit. This is about the romance behind them. And in red here, it has most talk of the hefty costs for soft forks around 100 million, right? So Zara continues, but we will pay a hefty cost for a soft uh, segwit soft fork. You just, just, you just can't get around it and you can't convince me. And then in red here, more attack the minor, minority chain talk. Zara, I will talk to you a bit about killing minor forks to lessen your worries. Zara, one, I suggest a hard fork will only be activated after 95% of the hash rate signals for it, but it won't be fixed that way in the code. Two, after the hard fork, exchangers may want to add their minor coin, which according to the to the experience with Ethan Eve, and ETH and ETC, the price will be maintained at a greater disparity, like 1 to 10. LTC like BTC and unlike ETH, adjust its difficulty every 200, 2016 blocks. So before the current difficulty period ends, and the rewards for equivalent hash rate are the same, but the price ratio is 1 to 10. So a rational miner will go out for the higher price coins. There wouldn't be anyone mining the old chain. If there's uh, speculators looking to pump the miner coin and mine at the loss, my multi pool could switch to mining empty blocks within with 51% hash rate. So I will offer it anyone who also mines the chain. And then when no one mines the old chain, I would mine the new coin, which effectively ensures a total death for the old chain. So, whew, um, let's break this dialogue down, especially this last part where you are having a big mining pool operator actively stating that they would kill a, a chain, a blockchain if you will, and that their biggest concern has to do with their loss of funds when switching from um, to SegWit. This is pretty vicious if you think. Um, what interest is it of any miner if someone just goes off and does their own thing? Um, what's it to them, really? I mean, how does it really decrease or increase or devalue their coins? Even with the ETH and ETC breakup, I mean, ETC still ex exists. It has a strong, vibrant community, but it's doing its own little thing. Uh, ETH in itself is trading almost close to $300 right now. Let me check the price, if you will. Okay, so the, you know we had a bit of a crash. So Ethereum is at one seventy eight ninety eight a coin, and Ethereum Classic is at sixteen twenty. So there's a big difference there. Um, the market cap is about a billion. All right, I guess so. Um, with uh, over a hundred million in volume and trading in twenty four hour period for the Ethereum Classic. While Ethereum is a 16, almost 16 and a half billion market cap with a 466 million volume. So at a 10% increase, Ethereum Classic has a 9.2% increase over the last 24 hours. Um, yeah, um, that just seems very malicious and very petty. If people split, people split. Um, is really ultimately not the place, I think, of anyone to state or try to block or stop somebody from implementing these type of projects. I just It just seems very malicious. And now that we know that the ASIC boost is um, in these bit miners um, created by Bitmain, that they have you know a significant financial incentive not to activate SegWit on Bitcoin. So going back to the original article by Zane San, uh, getting to the second part. So Litcoin's own SegWit debate. Our goals have always been explicitly clear according to the Hong Kong agreement. Everyone agreed to first activate SegWit and one year later after to, after to initiate a hard fork to 2 megabyte block size limit. But CORE did not uphold their end of the Hong Kong agreement. After it became clear that SegWit would not activate on Bitcoin, the scaling debate spilled over into the Litecoin community, and there was a push to first activate SegWit there as an example for the Bitcoin community. As stated in my last article, why I will I'm still not voting for SegWit, while the cryptocurrency's attention was focused on Bitcoin scaling debate, a mysterious new Litecoin developer, uh, Shaolin Fry, appeared on the scene. Now, Shaolin Fry appears to be deeply familiar with SegWit, and in a short amount of time helped the rest of the 
LTC development team to finish writing their SegWit implementations. Once he secured the title of Litecoin developer, he switched his focus to Bitcoin, proposing the user-activated soft fork. After launching his campaign for uh, UASF on Bitcoin, he did the same for Litecoin and piggybacked on the reputation of Charlie Lee to push for the UASF there too. Our wishes have always been simple and clear, SegWit and a block size increase as we agree in the Hong Kong Roundtable Agreement. I don't think Shaolin Fry is that mysterious. I think he's been part of the community, but that's just very interesting. I'm going to have to re-examine that. Um, SegWit and block size increase is agreed in the Hong Kong Roundtable Agreement. Fortunately, there's not the same opposition towards increasing the block size among the Litecoin community, and we're, and we're able to come to a consensus much more peacefully. In the Litecoin Global Roundtable Resolution, this agreement was closely modeled on the Bitcoin's Hong Kong agreement with SegWit activation first followed by a block size increase. This fully demonstrates that the broader community is not opposed to the Hong Kong agreement, so I do not understand why Bitcoin cores be consistently against the agreement that they have agreed already signed. 3. The far greater cost mentioned in the transcript. The question was answered in my very next message in the chat log. This is going to have a direct impact on the Bitcoin adoption of SegWit software. Very clear precedence. Both sides of the debate have been represented in the discussion of the SegWit on Litecoin. Core dispatched Shaolin Fry and the big block camp organizers the Litecoin Global Roundtable. Fortunately, without a Bitcoin core's stubborn opposition to block size increase, the Litecoin community was able to easily come to an agreement on their own version of the Bitcoin's Hong Kong agreement. Whale Panda's article completely ignored my own explanation and makes the claim without any evidence to support it that the greater cost I was referred to was ASIC boost. If this was the case, then the Litecoin version of the Hong Kong agreement that I have agreed to should have invalidated the greater cost argument. However, the greater cost I refer to was clearly about the implementation of the larger scaling debate and not about ASIC boost, as would when uh, Whale Panda concluded. The Bitmains oppose SegWit because of ASIC boost rumor. The rumor is easily refuted by asking if Bitmain only oppose SegWit because of ASIC boost, then why did they agree in Hong Kong to activate SegWit before ever activating a block size increase? I'll address the technical arguments in the log of the world. ASIC boost only works with mining pools and miner collaborators. It's easy to demonstrate that Bitmain's miners do not have the ASIC boost feature enabled. Anyone can take an ant miner machine and point it to any pool of their choosing or even a core SegWit test set and see for themselves that the hash rate and power efficiency are the same. No matter where the machine is pointed, Bitmain has uh, derived no sale benefit from the ASIC boost. ASIC boosts theoretically and actual cost savings are not the same. ASIC boost can theoretically deliver a 30% savings in energy consumption for a person using it, particularly it would be more likely 20%. Most people hearing this have significantly under misunderstood the implication. They think this will increase the miners' total savings by 20 to 30 percent. If you take the current Bitcoin price and assume in a figure of four cents per uh, kilowatt as electri electri electricity costs, then an SS9 miner will cost 15.36 percent of its total revenue on electricity, making the miner 20 percent more efficient. Will bring power costs down to 12.9 percent, delivering a total advantage of 3 percent. Do you feel deceived? Weren't you, weren't you told the Bitmain was getting a 30 percent advantage? How can it actually be only 3 percent? How can we dispel the myth that Bitmain might be using ASIC boost on their own machines pointing to their own mining pool? Bitmain's operations are like those of a top secret military project. They are like those of any other business enterprise. Anything the company does will involve dozens if not hundreds of employees. Every mining far farm would have numerous employees who would certainly be able to figure out for themselves that the S9 machines they are running are only using 1 kilowatt instead of the expected 1.2. The employees would easily recognize that a 3 megawatt mining facility they work is should be able to handle 2,500 S9 machines, but some of them manage to have 3,000 of them. Bitmain obviously cannot pay their mining farm employees the millions of uh, RAPM and salary that are required to keep quiet about such a controversial secret. How could they possibly keep such activities so well hidden from the public? And would they so much trouble, secrecy, risk, and additional costs really be worth it if there's 3% gain for their mining operation? Uh, Bitmain supports Bitcoin or extended block proposals, which is also incompatible with ASIC boosts. Even without ASIC books, Bitmain's hardware would still have the lowest power consumption and greatest sales volume of any other Bitcoin mining hardware manufacturer. For years, Bitmain has been vocal in favoring the increasing the block size limit, the signing of the Hong Kong Agreement, the support to the Moon Extension block proposal. Uh, nothing about their actions is inconsistent with this. In fact, it is the Bitcoin core has been vocally opposed to both of these things, going so far as to renege on their agreement they signed in Hong Kong. 
I sincerely wish the court would give some kind of clear-cut explanation why they did not support the Hong Kong agreement, even as the Litecoin community has shown how easy it was for everyone to come to an agreement on the exact same terms. Core provided their reasons for opposing the Hong Kong agreement would go a long way towards helping the community move forward together. Of course, as long as Core is unwilling to do so, then they're left with no choice but look else, elsewhere. The, uh, the extended block proposal is enough to satisfy everyone's requirement. It's a block size increase, it activates SegWit, which is BIT 141, it enables Light, Lightning Network and Rootstock, and it deploys as a soft fork. If you do like the idea of a coin split caused by Core's um, user activated soft fork or DSF developer activated soft fork, if you want more on chain capacity, if you want Lightning Network and Rootstock, then please join me in supporting the extended block size. So there's a lot to cover here. Um, basically, you know, you have both the mining community, I should say, or the people that signed the Hong Kong agreement on both sides have basically broke, broken from the agreement. And while you can kind of, the muddiness of the ASIC boost, um, I explained here, I'm not quite understanding it. I, I do think that there's something off about it personally. And as for the core developers, they have been very much you know they just been very stubborn if you will about upgrading and it's causing a lot of contention and really nothing can really be significantly done unless there there's a split by done by the users or a change in the the core developers if you will so I have a link um, in the show notes which has a technical breakdown of the ASIC boost if you will or um, when someone has broken down a little bit further about what it can do, and this comes from um, BitcoinStackExchange.com. Uh, but in general, th there was some form of agreement, um, and both parties, or I should say all the parties, have just split, and it's um, reflected in the, the contentious uh, nature of the debate in itself. Um, a rise of more proposals beyond just at the time, which was Bitcoin Classic and Bitcoin Unlimited. Now you have, um, which an article I just read about the block extensions. You have other stuff like Mumble, uh, Wimble, um, different things that have been proposed to address the on-scaling issues uh, with Bitcoin, um, the fee issue, just all the issues in itself to bring Bitcoin forward. Um, into the marketplace, whether it be a mass adaption or just basically making things more navigable and uh, much easier for users and everyone involved within the community. So that is the Hong Kong bargain, thus ending our kind of mining aspects of uh, this series about um, how Bitcoin is a messy bitch. Um, the next episode after this is just a little bit of a breather of a break, if you will, which is just a bunch of random news that's been happening within the cryptocurrency space, but in the technology space in general. And then we're going to get into the nitty gritty about all these different proposals that have been happening. Um, first up, we're going to talk about uh, the solutions of the proposals that are coming from the BIPs, which are the... Uh, the bits that everyone talks about from 141 to 148, what those proposals are, um, who wrote them and who created them. We kind of talked a little bit about that when we uh, spoke about the other contributors, what bits that they uh, contributed and done, but we're going to get a little bit more detail of that. Um, then we're going to discuss, um, you know, Bitcoin Unlimited and Bitcoin Classic. We're going to talk about... All the other girls, as I'm going to call it, um, all the other proposals from Momo Wimbo to block extensions to um, the different proposals that people are putting up and out there in the space. And there's been a kind of a rush of them in the last couple of months. I will do a quick term episode before we get into that where we kind of go over what a soft fork is and a hard fork. Uh, we kind of discussed it a little bit here with the Hong Kong agreement, but... I just want to break it down again as we um, kind of get into what this space um, with the whole heart of the matter of the block size um, debate is. And then we'll just kind of round things up, kind of break down, kind of summarize what this whole, all the different parts that we are we have been discussing, what everything's about. Uh, we will discuss... Um, 
kind of after we go through the proposals, we also do what the new agreement is and what this user activated SegWit software that's supposed to happen in August 1st is going to be and uh, what that means and kind of cap everything I think to kind of finish everything out we'll talk about the way of Bitcoin because there you know there's different ways how people view Bitcoin and what they want and what they're seeking to do and kind of that kind of gets into the root of why there are such contentions is Bitcoin a store value coin where you just store a mass amount of wealth on um, a digital chain, if you will, on the internet? Or is it actually the internet of money? Or is it these things where you can do just a bit of everything? You can have store value, you can use it for the internet of money, you can use it for time, time stamping and doing all these different things with uh, Bitcoin and the and the block size, you know, blockchain technology. And we'll kind of, that'll be like the last bit of capping, you know, how the way of Bitcoin, as I'm calling it, you know, how people use Bitcoin and how they view it. So that just, just kind of gives you an idea of what the, the rest of the episodes are. Um, some of them are coming out this week and um, in next week. So thank you very much for listening. And until next time, thank you for listening. Please rate and review either through iTunes or Stitchers or any of the podcasting apps that you're currently using to listen to this show. Thank you. And until next time, this has been a Herosha Shine Space Odyssey Network production.